Again, my name is Roxy, and I'm the uh, Visitor Experience and Outreach Coordinator at the Lewis Latimer House Museum. For those who cannot see me, I'm an East Asian woman with shoulder length black hair. I'm joined by our esteemed panelists from the museum and Sandy Ground. Tonight, we're here for the Black Historic Sites and Conversation series presented by the Lewis Latimer House Museum. Black Historic Sites and Conversation is a series of virtual talks in collaboration with different Black heritage sites and cultural centers in the greater New York City area about the ongoing work of preserving, interpreting, and celebrating Black history and historical figures. Tonight's program is supported by the Mellon Foundation. Every community owes its existence and fatality to generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life, and some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort by, to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. We are on the ancestral lands of the Lenape people. We pay respects to their elders, past and present. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here tonight. And please join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events. I'll now share a few links in the chat for more information about the Lenape people. I would also like to take a minute to introduce our museum. The Lewis Latimer House Museum was the home to Black inventor Lewis Latimer from 1903 to 1928 in Flushing, Queens. For those who have not visited us before, this is a photo of how the house looks like in my, in my background. Um, Lewis Latimer contributed to modern technologies, including the early elevator system, bathrooms and railroad carts, the telephone, and most notably, the carbon filament light bulb. Before we start and after this introduction, we will hear a presentation on Sandy Ground by our panelists, followed by a conversation between the panelists and a Q&A session. If you have any questions that you would like the panelists to answer, please feel free to share them through the Q&A function. We will likely be able to get to eight to 10 questions depending on the time. There is an option to also upload any questions should you see your question in the list. Please also feel free to comment, share your thoughts in the chat as the presentation goes. I would like to quickly introduce our executive director, Ranyan, and let her share a few words before passing it to our speakers tonight. So without further ado, Ran. Thank you, Roxy. Hi, everyone. My name's Ran. I've been working at the Louis Latimer House Museum for several years now, and I've been the director since 2017. Um, it's been an incredible journey learning about Louis Latimer. And uh, we had this opportunity um, uh, last year, approached we were approached by another historic site in the metropolitan area to collaborate on a talk, a uh, virtual talk um, about each site's history and to be in conversation with each other. So we kind of used the opportunity and develop, developed it into a series um, that you're participating now. And uh, I'm really excited to welcome Sandy Ground today and to learn all about their history um, and be in conversation with each other. Thank you. I'll pass it on to Janice and Yvette. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Well, um, one second. I'm trying to get it in the slideshow. Okay. So can everyone see that? I just realized I didn't see the Jamboard um, because I want to see um, what people are saying. So I'm gonna stop share and ask Roxy if she would real quickly sh share the Jamboard so I could see what questions are being 
or statements? I think actually right now it's just a poster that I filled out. I don't think anyone uses okay. that feature. So, okay, no problem. Yeah. No problem. Um, oh my. Okay, it's, it says my screen is having some technical difficulties. Just a minute, let me share again. Mm -mm. Janice, can you share the screen? Let me see. <laughs> I'm happy to share as well if that helps. Okay, thank you. I appreciate yeah, that. No problem. Um... As we are doing that, I wouldn't mind. I know we want to do intros. Yes, please go ahead with um, introductions. Thank I was going to say um, age before beauty. So if Yvette wants to go first. <laughs> I'm okay, I'm gonna see you on Sunday. I'll <laughs> I'll get you for that. Okay. <laughs> so my name is Yvette Jordan, Yvette Taylor Jordan. I am a seventh generation descendant of um Sandy Ground. And I'll explain a little bit about that later. I'm also in in I'm also an educator. I'm a history teacher in Newark, New Jersey, and at Rossville Amy Zion Church, which we'll talk about in our talk. I'm the chair of the trustee board right now. Janice, you want to share? Of course I do. Good evening, everyone. Um, just want to say hi to everyone first, all the descendants on the line and anyone else. Um, my name is Janice Laborde Casimir. I am, uh, I guess, a self-proclaimed historian. Um, I'm also a trustee member for Rossville Amy Zion. I am a retired United States park ranger. And my latest venture is becoming a registered nurse. Um, and now I, 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 um, I'm doing historic preservation. So thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Louis Lattimore and Yvette. Okay. All righty, thank you both. Well, first, um, Janice and I want to say thank you to the Lewis Lattimore House Museum for this invitation. Um, it, it really was surprising for me and um, humbling that you asked us and want us here. We have a lot of information, yet um, Ran and Roxy said you have, I think, either 10 or 15 minutes and Janice and said, and I said, are you crazy? There's no way we can do that. So we'll be talking very quickly, okay? So listen um, attentively. So what you're looking at now is, is our image is, but um, also in back of that is Russell Amy Zion Church. Next slide, please. So when you think of Sandy Ground first, um, I want to say, where is Sandy Ground, actually? So Sandy Ground is located on the southwestern end of Staten Island, the Forgotten Borough, however, not so forgotten anymore. It's also listed on the national and state registers of historic places. So I have a map on your left. You can see a lavender dot there, and that's where Sandy Ground is. And then the um, map in the forefront is really, um, it shows more where Sandy Ground actually is. And when the area was first um, acknowledged as a his historic site, we had these um, identifiers saying his historic Sandy Ground and settled by free Blacks in the early 1800s. However, we don't see them up anymore. And we'll explain a little bit about that later as well. Next slide, please. 
So first thing we want to acknowledge is that language is important. And so many times when someone is talking about Sandy Brown or they think they know so much about Sandy Brown, they will say that it was established by freed, freed Blacks or free slaves or, or freed slaves. Sandy Ground was established by free, no D, free, free Blacks. And um, that distinction is really critical when you're talking about the importance of social mobility and economic opportunity. Because when somebody is free, they have the ability to move wherever they want and in the early 1800s, of course, there were so many enslaved Blacks that mobility was not easy for them. However, those who settled in Sandy Ground were free, F-R-E-E. -E. Um, unfortunately, the political power um, wasn't there. And political power al always enables a a community or a group to effectuate real power and change. And that was not present, unfortunately, in this area at that time. The significance of Sandy Ground is that is it is the oldest continuously inhabited free Black settlement by um, descendants of the original settlers in the United States. So as I said, I am a seventh generation descendant. I don't live in Sandy Ground any, anymore. However, I was born and raised there until um, I was in elementary school and my mother and grandmother lived there all of their lives mostly. So next slide. Janice. But you can't say Sandy Ground without saying Snow Hill, Maryland, and some other places. So Sandy Ground was settled. Um, it, it was settled by um, oyster men at some point from Snow Hill, Maryland. And they were coming from Snow Hill, Maryland um, before they settled there. They were going back and forth. There was an industry, an oyster industry. So they were going there. For, for work and then going back to Snow Hill, Maryland. So at some point, Maryland says, hey, we're taking away some of your rights. You, you can't do this. You can't do that. You, um, they're, they're, they were enacting laws that took away freedom from free Blacks. Remember you guys said, not a D, free Blacks. So instead of being under the jurisdiction of Maryland and being enslaved when you were not enslaved at, at that point or any point, um, they chose to, to migrate to Sandy Ground permanently. Now, when they went to Sandy Ground, there were whites there and there also were indigenous people living there. So it was a really a mixed culture. But also when you look at Sandy Ground and the early settlers, you look at these two brothers, Silas and Moses Harris, and they came and bought land there. Now, they were not recorded as buying land there. There was someone else that, that was recorded. That was Captain John Jackson. So according to the census, Captain John Jackson in 1828 was the first recorded Black man to buy land in Sandy Ground on Staten Island, in Staten Island period. Now, I have to say, Captain John Jackson is my great uncle. Well, a couple of greats, more than one great. So um, he was also known, um, he's a captain, so he had to have a boat, right? So his boat was called the Columbia Lewis. The Columbia Lewis, um, in addition to serving for his industry or for work, was known and is now known to have um, ushered enslaved people to safety in Sandy Ground. So it was absolutely a part of the Underground Railroad system. Next slide, please. 
So when when you think about people migrating from a place, you you know, from one place, Snow Hill, Maryland, also Delaware and Virginia, you think about having industry. You have to have business. People are coming here. They have to do things. So we have um, Joe Bishop's Black, Blacksmith Shop. And Joe, and that was an interesting shop only because it was housed in a building that um, in 1982, when it burned down, was 125 years old. So it was built some, sometime around the 1850s. And not only are we looking at trades, we're looking at obviously the oyster community. Um, uh, we're looking at um, farming. And later on, we look at people starting actual businesses, boarding houses. We're looking at um, bars, Cooper's Tavern and, and uh, candy stores. And um, my, also my, my great, great grandmother used to do things like sell apple dumplings, you know? So there are, there are all these kind of industries built into this system of Sandy Ground to, to, to keep you know, uh, things moving. Next slide, please. So uh, uh, Sandy Ground, you know, so we have, we have people migrating to Sandy Ground. We have these industries. And then as we go along, around 1916, the industry started to dry up a little bit, um, the oyster industry because there was uh, pollution in the, in the water, but the interest never dried up. So we have this man, Dr. William Ak Askins and the Trust for Public Land. He did an archeological dig in 1970 and found that there were um, the remains of Native American um, villages in Sandy Ground. Uh, in fact, there is a, a Native American village that was where the footprint of Roseville Amy Zion churches. So with him doing that, that dig, his findings led him to now um, apply for, for the, to the national registry to make this an archeological district. And now what, what lies in that archeological district are these five structures that are all New York City landmarks. Uh, we have, next slide please. We have the Bayman's houses. So the Bayman's houses were houses usually built um, for workers. And the interesting thing is that Yvette and I went to Snow Hill, Maryland, uh, and there were similar houses there. So we, we it was such an interesting connection to see. So we have two Bayman's houses that are all landmarks. Every single property that we talk about are New York City landmarks. Um, one was built in 1878, and the actual one, the other one was actually built in 1898. Uh, Roseville and Zion uh, became owners of these Bayman houses in the 1990s. We still have ownership of them, and we are, you know, there because they're landmarks. We have to continue to keep and uphold the the look of it, as you see here. Next slide, please. And Roseville and Zion Church. Now, the original church, church was built in 1850, and it was not where it is today. The original church, there was a gentleman by the name of William Pitts. He was the first minister for the Roseville Amity Zion Church. He purchased a parcel of land on Crabtree Avenue, and that was the original site of the church. So as he, he purchased that land, he also they also built... Um, a cemetery. So now uh, around 1850, you have this, you know, kind of this, this newly established church. And then around 1897, the congregation got so big that they couldn't stay there any longer. So then we, now we go and build this site. This, this church here is, um, the, the new site is 584 Bloomingdale Road. And that was built in 1897, and I believe it it was seven thousand dollars to purchase the land and build that building back then, and the funds were raised by the actual congregation. This is the church that Yvette and I and so and some other people online actually still attend to this day. Next slide, please. Okay, another structure that is a city landmark is the 
um, Reverend Isaac Coleman and Rebecca Gray Coleman House. And this was, excuse me, this was built in 1864. This is a part of um, my family and my great grandmother is Rebecca Gray. Well, she was landing after Coleman because Reverend Isaac Coleman, who was a minister also at Rossville Amy Zion died and she married my great grandfather. So on the left, you can see the original structure and this is how it is right now on your right. Okay, next slide, please. The Rossville Amy Zion Church has a cemetery which is um, was founded in the early 1800s, mid 1800s actually, and is in New York City landmark. And what is interesting about the cemetery is that you can find in the cemetery um, tombstones showing that the people there were from four wars, I believe. Am I right, Janice? Yes, yeah, she is nodding her head four wars. So that's a big thing for us. And then also in case nobody was aware in in 2017, I believe, um, there were over 500 interred bodies found at our cemetery, which is the largest find outside of the African um, burial ground in lower Manhattan in New York City. So that was huge news for us. So that's our cemetery right there. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so I'm going to mention about a couple of things that are annual events for us, and that is Family Day. And Rossville Amy Zion, um, has a family day every year in the first Sunday in June, and it was started by Reverend Wallace Lee in 1968. And this was an, is rather an annual gathering. It's a reunion of families, the original families, and also new families who have found Rossville Amy Zion in the community and want to share um, their families with us. So it's a way of us remembering and celebrating our heritage and the community as well. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so what have the descendants done to preserve their heritage? Because obviously as as I was explaining and Janice was really expounding upon, um, we have a lot we feel we can celebrate. So in 1977, Reverend Ellis Freeman recognized the need to um, celebrate our heritage in a way by forming forming the Sandy Ground Historical Society. So what happened is that there was a lot of building and a lot of speculation about new building, new communities coming in our area. And the church um, in particular was concerned and community residents were also concerned about who is coming here, what is happening to our community, how are things changing, and is it really affecting us, if at all? So we, we, and I'm talking about Rossville Amy Zion right now, um, had a campaign, Save Our Roots and Trees, because we were all about preservation. So Reverend Freeman formed a committee, and in 1978, they birthed the Sandy Ground Historical Society. That came out of Rossville AME Zion Church. Next slide, please. So I have the pleasure to talk about all the wonderful 
people, all the wonderful descendants of Sandy Ground. And there are so many, you know, we, we just picked a, a, a couple of people doing things, but I think we all are doing things in our own right. Um, as we speak about it, as we pass it along to our children and our nephews and our, and you know, our family members, we are all preserving the history. But this wonderful lady here, Lois Augusta Henry Mosley, was related to the captain, John Jackson, and an author of Sandy Ground Memories. She was a chef and she was a musician and she was also my grandmother. So my grandmother, um, what I would call was a griot, you know, if you if you think about a griot, a griot is a griot is a, a like a West African term, but it's like a storyteller that it that maintains tradition through oral history, and she would constantly ask us, "Do you know who your great grandmother is? Do you know who this is? Do you know who that is?" And we had to know those things, and if we didn't, she would constantly just 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 come at us until we said who it was. So she was. She was doing her work as a griot, which I believe, for me, inspired me to do this work. Next slide, please. And you, you also can't um, talk about Sandy Ground without talking about the Historical Society and one of its founding members, and that's Sylvia Harris D'Alessandro. Now, you see the name Harris, and, I, and if you were paying attention, I said that there were two brothers. Silas and Moses Harris, they were the one of amongst the first black men or black people to buy land in Sandy Ground on Staten Island. So she's a, she's related to the Harrises. So it's it, these are all full circle things. These are so she is also one of the founding members of the Sandy Ground Historical Society, who have really pushed push the Sandy Ground agenda as much as they can to the Department of Education, to whoever would listen. They were screaming, listen to us. This is important. We want to save this space. And Miss Sylvia is one of, she is one of the most wonderful people ever. And I'm very thankful for her. I don't waste an opportunity to tell her how much she means to me and what she's doing. Um, next slide, please. Then we got this wonderful woman, this beautiful young lady. Um, she is the owner of Shawnee's House uh, Restaurant on Staten Island, and, inter and interestingly enough, in Stapleton. Now, Stapleton also has roots in Black settlement history. Um, so she is in dead center of that, and she wastes no time telling everyone she is a Sandy Ground kid. She will tell you from the rooftop everywhere. She has been everywhere to the mayor's office, to the Department of Education, talking about sandy ground while she's feeding you good food. If you're on Staten Island, go to Shawnee Dixon's restaurant, Shawnee's house. Next, please. And last but not least, we saved the best for last. It's me. So, I mean, I, I didn't put this here, so don't think I did it. Yvette did this, okay? But um, inspired by my grandmother, when she passed away, it was like, because she was really holding on to the history, there was this desire for me to pick it up. And I said, what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? And all of a sudden, this opportunity came for me to to write a children's book. So I, write a, I wrote a children's book thinking, hey, let if I, if, if my age, you know, group doesn't know it, giving it to the children is going to be the best, the next best step. So in 2013, I wrote The Summer Adventures of Landon Henry, which are the two names of, of my ancestry. Next, please. So what changes have occurred? Now, I told you that, you know, I'm a, I'm a little younger than Yvette, not much, right, Yvette? But um, even as I was growing up, <laughs> even as I was growing up in the 80s, um, walking in sandy ground, there were these cobblestone roads. They were, were still, it looked very farm rural-like. 
um, now you see uh, these houses, these, you know, um, attached houses that cover every bit of every piece of land that is there. But um, so those were the changes that I, I that I've seen. Just the the in, the amount of houses that have come, the changes in the roads. I mean, we don't have the little stores. We don't have um, the things that we used to have. Um, so that's what I see. But Yvette, what did what do you see? What were your the changes that you saw? She's so humble, isn't she? Ha ha ha. Okay. <laughs> Um, it, you talk about changes and I know you were talking or we were talking about the cobblestone roads and, um, how everybody would share with each other. And we don't see that anymore. Actually, when you go outside, we would always, when we went outside of our church, see neighbors and other community residents, we would know and we don't anymore. And if we see them, there's um, zooming up and down a street where we would walk and, and play actually. So when I, uh, when I look at this, I get very upset and the fire you see or the evidence of a fire on the left happened in 1963 where so many edifices were really burned down all of them and most of them were not re rebuilt so when i look across the street and i see these attached houses i mean clearly it's an opportunity for a family it's an opportunity for um even if it's a single person, it's an opportunity for you to own a home or live in an area that is more suburban, um, so perhaps than where you came from. So that's great for you. However, the challenges, and may I have the next slide, please? The challenges are that um, this development for so many of us who are from Sandy Ground, who who trace our lineage there, really feels like encroachment. And the reason I say that is because um, Janice was saying um, so many things have changed and there isn't a store. And I'm not talking about a corner store, a bodega. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a neighborhood store where people would go and, and, um, really socialize with each other and buy things from each other. So that is not there anymore. It, in addition, the um, physical presence of so many people is not there at our church. Yes, they are on Zoom, and that's great. However, the numbers are lessening, and that is unfortunate, although we plan on getting that back. And I see my minister is on the line, so I know he's smiling right now. So... Um, and then also what's unfortunate is a huge um, misinformation or lack of knowledge about Sandy Ground and the community. And um, I don't want to say we were here first. However, it's, it's, um, it's a feeling that we were here first. And it wasn't only a Black area. It was also... Um, a community with so many others. As you said, Roxy, in the beginning, Lenape Indians were there. They were there. Some whites were there. There were, we were all working with each other. So that is also um, sad. We don't see that anymore. So in terms of opportunities, Janice, you want to mention about that? Definitely, definitely. So um, we have some interesting opportunities for education and it really um, kudos to the Historical Society for doing a number of things. Um, they, for many years, 
were um, receiving up to, uh, I think maybe 3000 students and talking about Sandy Ground and having this, this um, field trip program and um, educating you know, the, the, the school age children on what Sandy Ground was. Um, and in addition to that, there is an actual school. The school is named the Kathleen, Kathleen Grimm School for Leadership and Sustainability at Sandy Ground. It's literally walking distance from our church and from our Bayman's houses. And the, you know, this was a fight and a struggle, but these are opportunities to go into the uh, to this to this elementary school and talk about Sandy Ground. It has the name of Sandy Ground in it. Um, we we also have um, partnership opportunities. Maybe um, uh, about six months ago, someone called us from the Jay Heritage Center in Rye, New York, and that's the John Jay Estate. If you if you don't know what that is, but they they're tracing people from Sandy Ground to their area, so they they are this wonderful like this wonderfully um, multi-million dollar facility. And they're like, we wanna work with you. And there are all these wonderful opportunities. Um, it, the, the, what does it say? The, the, in the Bible it says, the, the harvest is plenty, but the, but the, the people are few. So we, we have all these wonderful opportunities, but not as many people wanting to help preserve these opportunities or be a part of them. But we do have them which is great. So we are looking for people to step up uh, to say, we wanna help, if you do. Next slide. Thank please. you. So we just wanted to give you a couple of resources. Um, Roseville and Zion Church, uh, we are in attendance um, every week, every Sunday, both in person and on Zoom. and. We also wanted to give you our website, take a look at it. It does have the history of our church as well as, obviously you can't say Roseville without saying um, Sandy Ground or Sandy Ground without saying Roseville. Yeah, I mean, I just wanna mention one thing and I know we'll probably like run over our time, but when you look at Sandy Ground, you look at there were several fires, but what is still standing there? That, that church is still standing there. So it 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 was a a, a pinnacle. It was a a thing that held us together, and it still does to this day. Um, and then I also wanted to share Shawnee's house information. Um, check her out, and um, come when you come to visit um, Staten Island, go and visit Shawnee's house restaurant. It's, it's it, wonderful soul food, and that is it. I, I, I don't think there's a next slide, but I. Oops. Thank you so much, Denise and Yvette, for the wonderful presentation. Um, so I have so many questions myself, but I'll go over some of the audience questions first. Um, Brenda asked, why were the old houses on stilts? Were the old houses on stilts? Yep, yeah, uh, Brenda, would you like to clarify your question? She was asking why they looked oh, like- Oh, raised, raised, raised. Janice. I, that's, that's actually, I don't know, to be honest with you. I mean- I'm, when, I'm not when, sure either. I mean, when when you when all I can think of, I mean, usually that's a structural thing, right? Um, mm -hmm. But our our Bayman's houses are not raised, and and neither is the Coleman house. So now, so you know, we are by a, a bay. You know, we are by a waterway. That's the only logical answer I would think. The reason why that you saw raised houses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, Ashley Kenner said there is a Griot Museum of Black History in St. Louis. Thank you, Ashley. Um, we also have 
Patricia, she uh, asked who's that pictured behind Yvette. Yvette, yeah. do you want to talk about the yes. picture background? Yes. Um, what I was going to say is that was Sandy Ground in this, the 60s, I believe. And that's a picture of several members of the Moody family, Moody and Pedro family. Um, so I can get out of the way. You can see. But um, if you look, that was really typical of how we played in the area and the houses you can see. Now, if you go down, and that's um, Clay Pit Road, if you go down, it's it's wall to wall, houses on top of houses on top of houses, and it's just very different. So that's who it is in the picture. I don't see any of them on right now. I was wondering if any of them are here, but they're not though. Okay. Thank you, Yvette. Um, Bernadine asks, how did the Blacks from Snow Hill travel to Sandy Grounds? Were they mariners? Um, I would just um, quickly add that it is really interesting that you mentioned that the J Heritage Center from Rye, New York also reached out. Um, there seemed, there definitely seems to have been a lot of uh, free Blacks traveling by water. One of the Louis Latimer descendants on our board actually told me that uh, his family members uh, told him about stories of their ancestors uh, being uh, traveling, uh, being helped by indigenous people who kind of boated them across Long Island Sound to help them travel. Um, so I just thought that was an interesting uh, connection there. Uh, would you like to share more about how um, how the how people traveled from Snow Hill to Sandy Grounds? Do you have any information on that? It, it, you know, it's interesting because as uh, Yvette and I went to Snow Hill, it's a, a super tiny town with a, with a large waterway. So, I mean, it, it wouldn't make sense as the oystermen were coming back and forth that that would be the, the method or the mode of transportation for them. They did own boats. So that that is the, the one of the most obvious ways of them traveling. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Deb was wondering about the Stapleton, Sandy Ground, and AME Church connections. Would you talk more about that? I'm still trying to figure out the Stapleton connection. We, I, 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 I haven't seen the connection. What I do know is that there, there were similar communities. Um, and Stapleton, it, they call, they kind of mirrored each other. But I don't know, I haven't seen the connection um, with families yet. I haven't gone that deep, but I think there might be a bishop connection. I think the bishops might have been in Staten Island and we talk about the Joe Bishop blacksmith shop. And also, um, Actually, our pastor on tonight, he's a bishop as well. We just got a descendant to come. And he's in our church for like the first time we've had a descendant that, that is now the leader of our church. But um, I, I haven't drawn those connections. We're trying to do that. We're trying to do that now. There's a lot of things that are, are un, that we don't know yet. You know, we're, we're still trying, which we're trying to really preserve it. And as you are preserving it, it really is a, a juggling act, you know, learning more, preserving it, you know, doing all these wonderful things. So there will be some connections drawn with Stapleton and Sandy, and, um, um, Sandy Ground at some point. Thank you. Um, Jamira is curious about your thoughts on the future. With such an amazing past that must be continually preserved. What else do you see in store for the future of the Sandy Ground community? That's a great question, Jamira. She's our cousin. <laughs> and that's a great question. Um, and she's also, she is an eighth generation descendant, or maybe ninth. 
eight, eight, eight. eight. Okay. But um, what what I would say is that um, in in terms of the Sandy Ground community, I think unless we, and this is the radical me, unless we rise up and and um, really spread our story, spread our message, form partnerships as um, Janice was explaining earlier, offered ourselves um, for educational webinars, meetings, um, open our church up for community meetings. And um, I think that Sandy Ground community may be enveloped by those who have, in my view, encroached. So I don't know if Janice feels the same as I do. Uh, um, yeah. Um, the future. Hmm. I mean, I definitely share your sentiment. Um, what I will say is we, we definitely have hopes to have some sort of maybe a museum, um, in, in one of those Bayman houses, not sure yet. That's, we might be leading towards that way, but we do have to continue to tell the stories. We have to be our own miniature griots. If you can tell the story to one person, the person sitting next to you, I mean, I I do not, I do not hesitate to tell people where I come from and what it is. It's so important. And it's it's so very interesting because in the last two weeks, I've met people that know where Sandy Ground is. And I'm in Manhattan and they're like, I know Sandy Ground. And I'm like, really? How do you know Sandy Ground? And the, and so we just have to tell the story. And as everyone is on this line, you tell the story, not only this story, but your story. We all should be telling our, all of our stories because mm -hmm. they're a collective story. This is just our part and you have your part. So let, let's, let's start doing that and telling the stories and connecting them. Thank you so much. Um, I'm also curious, um, adding to the previous question, um, what could you talk more about kind of the the community um, in Sandy Ground and around Sandy Ground today? Um, how has the population shifted over the years? Um, and how does the site relate to the surrounding communities now? Hmm. So, um... The population has absolutely shifted. It is um, predominantly white, um, some Hispanic, but predominantly white in terms of the interaction. And I think that's what you were alluding to. There is not a lot of it. Um, we have gone out um and this was pre-covid we would go out our choir would around holiday time and sing carols uh, and go down the streets and some sometimes we would get attention other times we wouldn't but i think folks appreciated it unfortunately a few years ago we had a um um we experienced some vandalism and that was extremely upsetting so we were not sure if it was racially motivated or not but we did experience vandalism so in terms of the interaction there really isn't interaction at all when we invite um for example i mentioned about family day or if we have something um we would have like a harvest fest in the fall and there weren't many attendees from the community and that's unfortunate because years ago the community would support and come and and it's just not happening anymore so we realize it's our responsibility to go out and be stewards of the word and that's what we do as christians since since we do come from russell ame zion church so that's our responsibility as as Christians. So we have to do that, but also um, recognizing that there is a change in the area, a change in the air, 
and always um, so being cognizant of that. Janice, I don't know if you want to add on anything. No, I think you said you, uh, you said enough. Thank you. Um, the Prater is curious about whether uh, there's any consideration of becoming part of the Parks Department for further the preservation work. Um, what's the ownership status of the site? Um, uh, Crossroad, becoming a part, you said, can you can you repeat that again? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, someone asked if there's any consideration of becoming part of Parks Department, and I added to that asking what the ownership status of the site is. The ownership status of what site? Oh, Land ground? The ground, yeah. Okay, so I, I, okay. So I think it's important for you to understand that Sandy Ground is a community and the community, um, the people in the community own their homes and own their homes and those who still reside there own their homes. So in terms of um, ownership, th these are homeowners in a community that is listed on the city, state, and national registers of historic places. So in terms of that, um, and, um, and secondarily, the, ex excuse me, Ran. So, so the four um, or five register structures are- uh, Oh, are, is that what you were asking about? Yeah. Oh, well, uh, okay. So the church is is a part of a connectional body. So the New Jersey Conference of the African Mer African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church owns that. So um, in terms of the Bayman houses, Rossville, as Janice was explaining, um, we own those houses. Um, the Isaac Coleman house, um, Isaac Coleman and Rebecca Gray Coleman, that's in my family, the Landon family. So that is a family house and we have several owners who are family members who own shares of that house. Um, the, the cemetery is a part of our church. And what other, Janice? Did I miss anything else? Yeah, we also have uh, two members of the church that still live in that area that own their homes. Mm -hmm. that's, and that's, um, that's what actually makes us this continuously inhabited free Black settlement. As long as we have people still living there, we are continuously inhabited. I think that's really incredible. Speaking from a site <laughs> that is currently owned by the city uh, parks department, I think um, with your situation as like a living history, a living community, that's really incredible that you you do own your own sites or at least uh, the homes and the uh, individual structures. Hmm. Let's see, are there more questions? Dash. Um, Go ahead. There was a question or, or a comment by Brenda and I'm not sure what she means. Do you see it in the q and I see it too. Yeah, Brenda, if you could clarify your question, that would be great. Um, meanwhile, I do have another question. Um, what's what's your hope and vision for the congregation? You mentioned that you know the the congregation is so intertwined with the community, um, you know, throughout history. Um, how how do you envision it to continue uh, into the future in relation to the community and in relation to the rest of the sandy ground uh, buildings and sites? That that's something that we have to. That's a big question, Ren. That's a big question. Um, mm, 
I don't know. Yeah, I don't. That's a good question. That's a great question. What do you think, Yvette? Let, let me lament on that. Give me a second. Um, would you repeat it? Ran, would you repeat it, please? Um, I, I was asking what your hope and vision for the congregation is um, going into the future, considering okay. it has played such an important essential role throughout history in the Sandy Ground community. Yeah, I th I think the hope and vision is that obviously the um con the congregation will grow um with a physical presence and that they will take ownership of of spreading the story of um Sandy Brown but um the congregation has 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 a dual purpose, right? And their first is that um, they are spreading the message of Christ. And, and secondarily, it's that we are also informing people who we are as a people, who we are as Sandy Grounders, how we got there and, and how, how we are staying there and retaining um, who we are. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I see that we are at time. Do you want to share any last final thoughts or any, um, also, I would love to know how, um, all of us and the audience can support your work going forward. Mm. Age before beauty, she said, so I go first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to, again, thank you so much for this invitation. And um, I want to, for, for those who are on the webinar right now and, and have similar stories around the country or, or the city, to recognize your responsibility in sharing your story. As Janice was saying, this is our story. You must get out and share your own story so 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 that it lives and thrives and that is what happens so often that it dies as the elders die so hopefully you can take away um a chunk of what we shared about sandy ground and recognize that um we are here and of course um you can reach us at rossville ame zion ny.org and Janice will share Sharnay's information, which is also in the chat. Young and yes, uh, it's Sharnay's house restaurant. She's in Staten Island. You can Google that. Um, and really just closing, I I'm just I'm just uh, really actually excited um, just moving forward. This has put a battery in my pack, in my back, you know, like, I, you know, I, long gone are the days when I was a ranger. So now it's like coming back full fledged and I love it. I am excited and this is great. And you have to stay excited if you want to spread the word. If you want, if, I mean, in any capacity, you have to have a fire and I have that. And I'm thankful that you guys, um, brought us here to do this. It is extremely, ex we're extremely humbled by this, by this. We thank you very, very much. You're doing good work, ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you, Janice and Yvette for everything you do and your ongoing work. Um, this is, has been an incredible conversation.